And so I, uh, I asked you onto the, the um, episode today because I wanted mm-hmm. to, um, to talk with you because we, we went to college together and, um, right. and I, I've, I wanted to talk to somebody who had similar experiences because I know that um, <laughs> going to our college, there weren't all that many um, black students mm-hmm. there. And so I know that you kind of have, have similar experiences to me, but from a black mm-hmm. perspective, which I wanted to get to. So before we get into that, would you mind introducing yourself and just, um, you know, telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's an honor to, to be on this podcast. So um, I've done a couple of them and I like to pretend that I'm podcast famous, which I'm not, but just going back and listening to some of your episodes, it's, I, the first thing I, what I had was imposter syndrome. I was like, why is he asking me to be on this podcast, you know, and how you deliberate and your, your knowledge and just how much you like research before you just spew stuff in. And I made a conscious effort to think to, to, to try to listen to how many times you said, I think, or I feel, and it's like very rarely. It's basically, here's some data, here's something I'm processing and I'm gonna share it. Instead of like, well, I think, and this, and that, and the other. Not necessarily bad, but I was really appreciative of the stuff that you present. Um, but who I am, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm Kyle, Kyle Gunn. Um, and I'm one of seven kids. Um, and the Lord saved me at an early age. I was five when the Lord captured my heart. And um, I'm one of the few, I think, I think I was just blessed that the Lord has given me a strong sense of my salvation. I've never doubted. Um, and I know doubt is a real thing, but for me, I've been blessed with just always knowing um, when I, you know, when the Lord saved me. Um, so five, and then I was homeschooled all the way up to ninth grade, then I went to a public high school. And, you know, like I said, I'm 37 now. So high school back then was a whole lot different. We didn't have cell phones. um, But um, I was a popular kid in high school. Like, and everyone knew I was a Christian. I started, you know, the see you at the pole at Bible studies. And um, it was just a lot different. It was a great experience. Uh, I tend to be outgoing. So being homeschooled, even though I had a lot of brothers and sisters, was kind of like, "Eh, something more. Um, so I, I say I had the best, I have all of it. So first grade, I actually went to a Christian school, second grade to ninth grade, homeschool, then a public high school. And then I went to a Christian university, although they would say universities aren't Christian, they're Christ centered. So, uh, I went to a Christ centered university, Cedarville university. Um, you know, that's how I got to know you. We were the same, you know, the same college. Um, and then after, you know, after college, I did a few odd jobs, couldn't really find my way, went to school for, uh, Bible, college for Bible, couldn't really find my way. And, you know, recently, um, you know, I started this job here. I do dispatch now for a a trucking company. Absolutely love it. And, uh, I'm married, been married for seven years, have two beautiful kids. Uh, they are four and two. Um, and you know, on this podcast, we're gonna on this podcast. I know that you we're gonna just say honest things. So you know, my wife is white, so I have uh, mixed kids, and they're absolutely gorgeous. Everyone knows that. So it's just like mixed kids have the best of both worlds. I feel like um, uh, a daughter and a, and a son. Um, we. I think part of my, who I am also, you're informed by what you go through, both the good and the bad. So we suffered uh, greatly, you know, through several miscarriages to have the kids that we have. Uh, So that element of of suffering and pain allows me to, I think, understand a lot better and differently and to interact with people who have gone through the same thing because it's incredibly lonely. you know, I think we got, you said, mentioned earlier, you know, I had a, like, a, I do like a blog where I post during Black History Month. Um, and I think that's what kind of um, opened up this discussion. So I, I, I really enjoy history, specifically history that intersects Black, uh, Black American experience um, with the larger American experience. Um, so that's a little bit me in a nutshell. If you have, any, if I, if you want to know something, ask me. So I don't know if you, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, no, that's that's exactly why I wanted to talk to you because you have mm -hmm. you have a very uh, informed knowledge about Black history, um, but at the same time, you've you've gone through very conservative circles, and so uh, I think that that's kind of a, a rare thing because a lot of times those voices are are shut mm -hmm. down or you know people are skeptical of them. So I, I wanted right. to to be able to get your perspective from from somebody. Mm -hmm in those circles. And I, I talked to a wide yeah. variety of people. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, let, let's, um, let's kind of start at, at um, the beginning of, of kind of what brought you to my mind. We went to the sure. same college together. It was a, mm -hmm. a, a very conservative uh, Christian college, very white college. Um, and it was, it was so white. And I, I vividly remember that. Uh, and, and I don't know if you remember this, you probably do more vividly mm -hmm. than I do, but there was a worship leader who wore a rebel flag t-shirt in the front of chapel one day. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. I actually don't remember that when you like, I don't remember that because I think that when events like that happen, like, honestly, they happen so much that you kind of don't let them affect you. Like I remember it slightly, but not vividly. I remember seeing it and I like, I knew what the flag meant. I was just like, that's weird. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. For, for me, I, and this is, this is sad in retrospect, but the reason I remember it is I was like, uh, cause I think somebody emailed a complaint to uh, leadership and they just profusely apologized. And I was like, that's so ridiculous. People making a big deal out of somebody wearing a flag, because in my mind, mm -hmm. I, I came from, uh, you know, uh, farm country, Pennsylvania. And in my Christian school, you had, you had these uh, redneck guys who'd have trucks mm -hmm. and listen to country music and have rebel flags on their trucks. And I, you mm -hmm. just, you don't think anything of it. And so I was, mm -hmm. I was just thinking, why are, why are people making such a big deal about this, this stupid mm -hmm. flag? It's just a, you know, a flag that people who right. listen to country music like. And so I, I was oblivious, absolutely oblivious mm -hmm. to, how that came across to um, to mm -hmm. at least some, if not a lot of people in the the black community there. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you could start off our discussion on propaganda by talking about a little bit about some of the the racial propaganda, whether that's images, phrases, um, mm -hmm. actions that that are infused into our culture, yeah. especially the conservative Christian culture that mm -hmm. we might not realize. Right. Um... So, you know, I was thinking about this, like so when you were talking about propaganda and you laid out beautifully, like what it is, who's it works on. And like I said, I was reeling because, you know, I'm an educated, intelligent, smart black man. And you're like, well, it works on you. That's the primary demographic. And I was like, no, I know propaganda. That's, that's not true. And then the more I sat back and thought about it, the more I was just like, you know, it, you're right. That's how that's how it works. And propaganda, I think, is not so much now about beating you over the head with a club, dropping leaflets down, you know, during World War II. Um, you know, like propaganda, they honestly thought, hey, why don't we drop down condoms so that they think that we're more endowed than they are and then they're will cower. Like that was an idea that they had. Um, that's not so much propaganda anymore. Propaganda is subtle and it's supposed to be. Uh, because you need to buy into it and you need to realize it and you need to enjoy it and love it. The first thing I thought of was like the best, one of the best propaganda machines I think ever is Apple. You know, Apple has so inundated our culture that we have a demographic of people that will firmly believe that there's no better technology than Apple. And we have created a culture that hates green bubbles just because that propaganda has, you know, and that's our enemy. It's like, oh, get an iPhone, uh, you know what I mean? And I'm fully aware, like I have adopted that and I know when I'm being propagandized by Apple, like I have the, the AirPods, I have the watch and I have the phone and, you know. Um, so that was just a little aside there about propaganda. But some of the, the imagery that we see and some people don't really understand it, I would say, see one that's, more recent. So that was the whole Uncle Ben, Aunt Jemima, um, not scandal, but that whole saga of like why people were angry and why some weren't. Um, and people are were like, well, we're honoring them. You know, mostly white people would say that. 
me personally, I had, I had chosen long ago not to buy those products from, you know, Aunt Jemima, first of all, because I don't think it's that good, you know, but secondly, it was the imagery, you know, they were like, well, she got a job and she was able to provide and support. And it's like, yeah, but the whole Mammy archetype figure, like he took that from a minstrel show that he watched. Like he saw the like a character in blackface playing an Aunt Jemima figure and took that and put it on his box and labeled it because, you know, that's where black people belong in the kitchen. So those are some, that's an, a, a huge imagery. Um, and I also kind of, you know, with the whole Land of Lakes butter, you know, and people are like, well, you're erasing history. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, we're not erasing history. Um, history is still there. We still have powerful devices that can search anything like, um, and, you know, I would kind of say uh, some of more, I, a phrasing um, that is that's propagandized is because um, propaganda always has truth in it, right? And it, it has to in order for it to be believed and perpetuated. So one of them is that um, calling you know muscular women manly, like our former first lady Michelle Obama was often called a man because she, you know, she had sculpted biceps and she was in shape and she was fit. You know, the William sister often are called, you know, manly. And, and it's like, you can have the same type, you know, white woman the same way, you know, but they are elegant and demure and graceful. But, you know, calling a, you know, a muscular woman manly, that's something that has been propagated because here's the truth in it. When you, if you go to a bodybuilding show, everyone is trying to get darker because the muscles look better under the lights. That's, it just pops a little bit better. That's just because of, of coloring. It's nothing, not racism or anything. It's just, that's what, what it is. So when you have, um, you have kids, you watch them develop, a black kid will often look more muscular just because of just, that's the makeup of, of the body which in tail leads into um, actual like racist policy. So did you know a kid, um, black children often seem seven or eight years older than they actually are. So let's say you have an 11 year old, right? And let's say he's cutting up or acting up or doing whatever. A police officer rolls up, he will see that kid as 18 as an adult simply because the makeup of his body, that's just the way his body is. And so muscles develop and they look different, they look enhanced or whatever, what have you. Um, And so he will often be seen older and thus treated as such, even though it's an 11 year old kid or a 10 year old kid, just a boy, same thing happened, you know, story after story, Tamir Rice, you know, had a toy gun, rolled up, shot him, you know. Um, I think, uh, you know, being considered loud, those, these are phrasings. Um, or asking us, oh, you can probably dance really good, or you can probably sing. Just kind of those, those are all propagated that this is what we can do alone. Um, let's see, um, races like early on that we know is, is blackface. Everyone can spot that. Um, even, you know, watch old Bugs Bunny cartoons. And you're just like, um, did I see what I just, yes, you did. <laughs> Um, so those are, you know, some of the things that I've, I've noticed, and now it's a little bit more subtle. So here's the subtleness of it. Um, we, that is pervasive. We had a, a state Senator in Ohio who's, who is a doctor in the emergency room said, maybe COVID-19 affects the black community because they don't wash their hands as much. This, this is a, this is a state Senator who said this out loud. You know, not it was he said that verb like to somebody else, and you're just like, how can this be? And then and there's still a level of of doctors who actually think, you know, um, black skin is tougher or thicker, you know, and therefore they don't feel pain as much during the opioid crisis. If we if you remember that, um, the large numbers of them were not part of the black community. Why? because doctors actually prescribe pain meds less 
because they had the belief that was propagated that black people get addicted more. So the opioid crisis wasn't as effective, and maybe that's a maybe that could be construed as a good thing. But it was because they weren't being prescribed pain meds. So you had a whole a large population of groups of people in pain because doctors believed that they were addicted more, and they would use them to sell. Well, not, um, yeah, not not to mention the, right. res, the, the the response to you know the the crack epidemic. Oh, we need to we right. need to throw those people in jail, and then you got the yes. opioid epidemic. Oh, these poor it's people. It's a mental crisis. Need, yeah, we yeah. need to, to help them. Yeah, yeah. It's just, and uh, later on, we'll probably get into um, generalization versus indiv- individualizing certain things. Um, uh, yeah, I think I kind of lost my train of thought, but I think that's what I was kind of going with the settle. Oh, also, um, so the COVID-19. Now, further on, monkeypox is a huge thing. And there's subtlety in there that, it, you know, originated in Africa. Monkeys are often back in, you know, um, largely linked, you know, to Black people. You know what I mean? They were called monkeys and apes and gorillas and savages and things like that. So even the term monkeypox to me is just like I cringe at that at that terminology because I know because of propaganda it's going to conjure up images in certain people about who gets monkeypox you know and which can lead to divide of I don't want them living next to me I don't want Marta you know what I mean property values and that's simply just for the the term monkeypox um, and we had you know a prominent person continually over and over referred to COVID-19 as a Chinese flu, it's a Chinese virus. And there was a lot of Asian hate and Asian um, racism, racism because of that. Just the, just the terminology of what we use that people don't understand is like, we've been propagated to propagandize to, to view it that way. So, and even if the person's not necessarily using that way, we're, oh, we're just calling it monkey pot. Some of those images that will pop up that you have to guard against, you know, are not are not healthy. Um, yeah, and and what's what's really ironic to me is that the conservative crowd who would say that, uh, well, you know, he didn't he didn't mean it that way. The language mm-hmm. doesn't matter. Is mm-hmm. they're like, I'm not going to call him they them. They're like, language right. matter matters a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, it matters a whole lot when, uh, you know, when it's an issue that you recognize, mm-hmm. but when it's an issue that you don't want to have to deal with, then language doesn't mm-hmm. matter at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's a, a pretty good list of, of starters uh, of, uh, you know, some of the propaganda that's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, you know, if we would have had this conversation 10 years ago, I, mm-hmm. I would have been probably largely blind to it. And you now when I look back at my, at, at what kind of shifted it for me, uh, it was it was around the time of Eric Garner and um, you know the time of Ferguson, Missouri, um, mm-hmm. the, when when all those things started to happen. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was a decade after I graduated from college, and and I remember arguing with my wife when uh, when I was just telling her like I mean it's it's sad it's tragic. Um, but mm-hmm. I mean, like, I understand why the cop did what they did. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a big guy. If, if somebody who's six foot or taller is walking towards me and has any muscle mass whatsoever, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to be scared. Like, how do I know if, mm-hmm. if he's going to keep coming? How do I know if he has a knife? How do I mm-hmm. know if he's a gun? He reaches for his mm-hmm. waistband. How do I know what he's going to do? Like, I understand right. from the cop's perspective. And, mm-hmm. um, but she kept pushing back and she, she was like, well, yeah, okay. You might be able to understand from the cop's perspective, but nobody's trying to understand from the, the black mm-hmm. person's perspective. Like, mm-hmm. do you think he has a reason to be scared of the police, to be mm-hmm. scared that if he submits, he's going to be harmed or he's mm-hmm. you know, what we know about um, the criminal justice system and the, the conviction rate, you know, mm-hmm. if, if you get booked, you're pretty much going to have to cop a plea deal um, mm-hmm. in order to to get out of there because you're you're pretty much guilty, or you're going to sit in jail mm-hmm. forever, or you're going to go through all these expenses. So mm-hmm. um, it was it was when I finally started to look at the other side, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start listening to black people. I'm gonna start talking to them. 
I'm going mm -hmm. to start reading people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when I started reading black authors, that 100% just absolutely transformed my perspective. Cause you mm -hmm. can go all the way back to, um, like, uh, Du Bois and, mm -hmm. and, and he talks about some of the same issues that we have today. And you look at mm -hmm. police, police violence. It's not a new thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a new thing cause mm -hmm. I'm just hearing about it now, but it's right, not a new yeah. thing. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you know, listening to the, the, the black perspective is what, um, you know, ultimately helped me to start to transform. So I'd like mm -hmm. for, for you to talk about how important um, diverse stories and voices are mm -hmm. to, to cut through the historically white perspective and white propaganda. Right. Like what are some right. voices yeah. that maybe you recommend mm -hmm. and, and how does doing that cut through propaganda? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it's vitally important, I think. Um, because it, it, as we talk about, uh, as you've been talking through this season of propaganda, propaganda likes neat, tidy boxes. It likes to be able to put something in and categorize it. Um, it needs the buy-in of a large group of people. It needs silence. It needs to be pretty. It needs not to have any pushback. That's what propaganda is. Um, and so the removal of diverse stories and voices you get your perfect echo chamber. You get the feedback loop. You get every, the gratification that you want and you desire. Now that our natural tendency to want to categorize things in and of itself is not a bad thing. I think that's fundamentally how we were created. You know, we're both believers. So a lot of my worldview is going to be shaped by my belief, right? Uh, by Christianity. So one of the things is, being a created being, God put order into chaos. Then he, you know, Adam was charged to name all the, the animals. So he had to categorize them. He had to put them in, you know, in boxes or he had to tie them. So that in the, that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. Um, because that's, I, you know, that's fundamentally gets back to how we were created beings. And we know that our brains tend to want to, like our brains take shortcuts. When we see things, they will just put them where they're supposed to go and kind of fill that in. Um, and so when we have um, no diverse stories, it's easy and simple and it's categorized for us. Okay, this is what I know. Um, and, you know, even going to, you know, all, you know, mostly white college and, um, and things of that nature, it was very rare, you know, to have diverse voices. You know, there's a couple of years ago, something went around Facebook asking, who was your first black teacher? You know, and it was like, if you didn't grow up in that space, you're like, uh, I think one time a teacher's aide, what came, you know, and it's very hard to realize like, oh, wow, I didn't have any type of other input. And we know that diverse stories and like, you know, I have a natural bent and tendency. I love history, right? So, and we know that history is written by the victor. So of course our American history is going to have a level of veneer on it. It's gonna have that. It's gonna have a gloss. It's gonna have rough edges, um, you know, kind of um, shown down and things like that. There's nothing, well, yeah, there is something wrong with that, but that's how, what, how history is made. So diverse stories actually open that up. You know, it opens, like you said, when you started reading Black authors, actually open up your mind to, wow, I never would have known this if I didn't choose to read this. Also, I think the, the diverse stories cuts off or doesn't allow us to categorize, categorize things as other, as them, or they always, or the reason is because A, B, and C, or speaking into something that you're an outsider just looking in. Doesn't mean that, you know, your voice is not heard. For instance, like I can speak and say, you know, I think drug abuse is not healthy. It's not good for you. I've never done drugs. You know, I'm not a drug addict, but I can observe and say something about it. But sometimes saying something about things that you don't truly understand or have pl placed yourself into. And we see that this, this happened with our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, not trying to use that, you know, perfect phrasing, but Jesus, what did he do? He left 
the right hand of the Father to do what? He actually put on flesh, dwelt among us. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to. You know, and he was tempted just like us, experienced hunger just like us. He cried just like us. It wasn't as if he were just speaking into a situation, into a situation saying, y'all, y'all need Jesus, y'all need me, but I'm not really going to do anything about, like, I'm not going to insert myself into that situation. Does that mean we need to all go li- live in the hood? No, not at all. But at the same time, opening yourself up, and I think that's what diverse stories do. Do you know how, you know how amazing it is to have TV shows like Blackish, you know, just simply because it highlights, you know, a section of uh, society that it it goes against the narrative. So propaganda is also about feeding a narrative, correct? So it goes against that. You know, that's why Black Panther did so well, because it finally showed a nation that wasn't considered third world all the time. And it was fictitious. But why is Wakanda so highlighted? Why did that movie do so well? Because it reversed the narrative that, you know, black people are inferior and that they're subjugated and they should be, and they never have things right or they can't be successful. Um, so I think that's what diverse story, diverse stories do. And I think it's good for us to have those to hear those words, even if you vehement, you know, to disagree with it, you know, hearing other stories, voices allows you, I think, to be a better person and a better Christian. Like Jesus wasn't always, you know, in Galilee. You know, I need to go to Samaria. And he heard another perspective. You know, the story that, you know, that Jesus engaging with a woman anyway, then a Samaritan woman, then a woman who had been divorced and remarried and was living with, like, all three of those things are taboo in that culture. And he engaged with her, you know, and she engaged back. And then, you know, she had been propagandized about where do we worship? And he spoke into that. He spoke through it. He spoke uh, against it. And I think that we as Christ followers, it behooves us to, to do that instead of just like, well, these are our theologians, you know? So I hope that answered some of the, some of the questions that you have. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's actually a, a, a good lead into my next one because, and I almost, I'm scared to ask this question and I mean, don't ask it. <laughs> <laughs> You've, you've listened uh, and, and you know the outline of my season so far. Um, mm-hmm. I love the church, but I also, mm-hmm. I, uh, it hurts me to think about the, mm-hmm. the state of the church a lot of times. So I want to know, uh, mm-hmm. has your experience with the white Christian community, the, the white Christian church, been mm-hmm. any different than your experience with the broader white community? Or are they, are mm-hmm. they fairly indistinguishable? Like, does the, does the church... Mm-hmm. cut through the lies of racism better, worse, or, or about the same? And then why do you think it is that way? Yeah, <laughs> man, that's a doozy of a question. Um, so I, I want to go back and speak to um, my experience here. So even within the church, I think we we don't do a good job of when we when we preach the gospel for instance, like sin is often termed as black. So even as a young kid, I often thought that God hated me, the person, because I was black. And it was, you know, largely because of how it was presented and inscribed. Now, do I think some of the pastors were purposely saying, you know, you black people are actual sin embodiment? No. But we have to be cautious and careful of how we even say certain things. You know what I mean? So the idea that me being a stain or sin, I felt it was me. You know, so within the Christian community, you can go and Google images like racist images. And oftentimes the KKK and full regalia are meeting in churches, you know, you know, signs that say that Jesus saves, but not the nigger, you know, like, 
we do, you know, you're not welcome here. And I remember as I remember as a kid, I asked my my mother about this one day. We were traveling, and I was young, so the details are hazy. But I do remember this. We went and we sat down in church. And a little while later, I uh, usher came and whispered in my dad's ear, and my mom looked down the aisle and said, "Hey, we gotta go." With you know, we gotta go. So we got up and we left. And I was like, "Mom, why do we have to leave?" Um, and we were just visiting a church. Later on, she told me that they said that the scripture forbids being unequally yoked. And then they stopped. So con they considered unequal yokes worshiping together with Black people. And you and I know that is the most egregious disrespect to that verse ever because they just stopped at unequally yoked. Had nothing, they, they didn't read it in context. They didn't even read the rest of the verse. Um, and they applied that to people who did not look like them. That happened to me. And so I would say, how has the church dealt with it? I, not very well, you know? And I love the church. And I say this all the time. This is one of my one of the things I say, that the gospel is more powerful than what man tries to do to hinder it. So there is no reason why a black person would ever be a Christian just on the, on the surface because what has been perpetrated in the name of God to quote my people, right? Why on earth would I ever be a Christian or serve or worship this God that you claim gave you the right to own a person with a soul? But in order to get rid of that, you need something neat and tidy and said that Black people don't have souls. You know what I mean? So why on earth would I be a Christian? Well, it's because of the gospel's more power. It breaks down barriers. Um, and I and so were we, were we going to say something? Yeah, I, I was going to say, so you say that the gospel breaks down barriers, mm -hmm. but it doesn't seem like it does. So, so, right. so it, it, like, yeah. what's up with that? I would say, I mean, it, it does break down barriers in a um, spiritual sense. But a lot of times we'll stop there. For instance, you know, we just need to preach the gospel. We just need to preach the gospel. Yeah, but that dude's hungry. You know, <laughs> like Jesus didn't, um, he just didn't preach the gospel. He also fed the, the, the 5,000 with women and kids, right? He just didn't just do one or the other. It was both. So the gospel reached my heart because I saw the God behind the love. Nevertheless, Christ is preached. You know, I saw behind that. Um, and, there, and there were good people that did share the gospel. Um, and then second of all, I think, so we'll kind of move a little bit forward. So historically, we can say, man, that was, that was really a bad time. Now, let's just not talk about it. Don't talk about it too much, you know. Um, because you'll be like one of those. You'll be woke, and we're tired of hearing about it. Um, and then everything and anything becomes considered woke, just be, if you talk about injustice, you know. And I'm just like, how did, how and why is seeking justice something that is mandated? Walk humbly, you know, do good and seek justice. How has that become something that's woke, like or bad? Um, and partly it can be because if we're only looking at the temporal, that doesn't add and not look at the eternal, um, then the idea of just justice here and now does fix some problems, it dresses it up, but it doesn't fix the eternal problem, ultimate justice, right? But if you just only seek ultimate justice and you forget the injustice that's happening on the temporal level here on earth, then you're just like, you stay where you are, you continue to suffer this injustice, but one day it will all be made right. It's like, no, I think we're called to reverse the effects of the fall. I think we want to, to work on those injustices. So that's from the Christian perspective. And I keep saying like all this, I don't hate the church. I'm not into sheep bashing. Um, I, love, I love the church, I'm part of her. You know, I'm part of the bride of Christ. Um, the larger, white community, um, I would say, has handled it a lot better. And I'm racking my brain when this question was posed, like, why? Shouldn't it be the opposite? 
but somehow I don't think it is from from my experience that you know the one the, those who don't call themselves believers have oftentimes been better at cutting through the propaganda and the lies and racism and even acknowledging it or doing some way to fix it for lack of, of better words. Um, and I don't know why that is. And I think sometimes it's okay to not have all the answers. Like, I don't know why, but I wish it weren't so. And you know, Derek, time and time again, like the church has gotten things really wrong, you know, really wrong. Um, but there are things that, that we get right. But for some reason, I don't know why, it, you know, we have, it's not, it hasn't been as well as what I would like to have it be as a Christ follower. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's acceptable to not know. Um, and, and I think it's good to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So I want to move on to, I, I think, the part that I was looking forward to the most because uh, mm-hmm. every year, you post um, something every day during Black History mm-hmm. Month, uh, a, a different story. I don't know. Do you do different ones every year, or do you? Do you... Um, some, yeah, some get recycled, um, but I like to try to choose different ones every year. Or sometimes I'll focus on a theme, um, but yeah, it just highlights Black History during the month of February. Yeah, and I think I think uncovering history is really important because it, it it's those mm-hmm. diverse voices, but then it's also mm-hmm. for me, um, you know, books like uh, The Color of Law was extremely mm-hmm. helpful for me because it's okay. He's just dispassionately looking at mm-hmm. here's an event, here's an event, here's an event, here's an event, mm-hmm. and it's like, well, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to say, wow, that's a lot of events like right. this. What's mm-hmm. the common denominator? And mm-hmm. you can you can start piecing things together yourself yeah. um, just from just from dispassionate yeah. facts. So I I love your Black History Month. Um, mm-hmm. Before I ask you a question about it, does it ever strike you? I'm sure it has, but does it ever strike you that it's a little bit ironic that Black History mm-hmm. Month is the shortest month of the year that they picked? Do you think that's um, a conspiracy? They they picked the t- no, month with 28 a, days. No, not at all. Okay. not at all. I'll tell you. I'll tell you why. It's because um, Lincoln and Frederick Douglass birth birthdays happened in the second week of February. So long before there was actually a Black History Month, you know, Blacks would actually, you know, honor and celebrate that week because, you know, as you know, Abraham Lincoln, um, Emancipation Proclamation of the Slaves, right? Frederick Douglass, huge in the abolition movement. So Frederick Douglass, I think his birthday, he celebrated on the 14th. I believe Lincoln's birthday was on the 12th. So it may it makes sense because it was actually called Negro Week um, when it was first instituted and adopted. Um, and that was a term that they used back then for black people, right? So it was called, it was just a week at first and then it just expanded to the whole month. So I don't know, it's, it wasn't, it's not a conspiracy. It's not like, okay, you just get 28 days. Maybe we'll give you 29 uh, every now and then we'll call it a leap year. You know what I mean? No, so it's not a conspiracy. It was just, literally, you know, Two of the one, two of the greatest figures in history, um, their birthdays coincide in February. So. Okay, that's 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 really good to know because when you start going down, uh, you know, different uh, mm-hmm. rabbit holes about uh, government right. and, and racism mm-hmm. and stuff, you uh, it's easy to be really cynical about motives. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> okay, so here's my my first question in relation to that. You know, heritage and tradition we would say are important things. And and that's part of the reason that, that we celebrate black history month, you know, Mm that there's, there's heritage and tradition that's wrapped up in there that we, we celebrate. Um, so when you think about heritage and tradition, they are are good things that we try to keep and that we, we pass down. Um, but when you, when you take a look at propaganda, you know, that's, it's sort of, the same thing. It's it's information that we want to propagate and mm-hmm. hand down. Um, mm-hmm. So, when when you look back through history, um, through U.S. history in particular, do you think that mm-hmm. the United States is uh, the type of nation that um, 
when, when we talk about heritage and when we talk about mm -hmm. um, making America great again, like it used to be mm -hmm. like our heritage was, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you distinguish between these two ideas of what is good heritage and tradition to pass down mm -hmm. and what is mythology and, and propaganda? Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the good things about history and trying to under uncover um, what really happened um, is the key. And history should not only be looking for the stories that make us feel good. Uh, but, you know, I think history tells us where we've been, where we are and where we are going. That's what I always say about history. It's a, it's, it's a live uh, and it's good for us. So I think, you know, what do we hand down? What is tradition? What is heritage? What should we be proud of? What should we, you know, leave behind or, or let go? Um, goes back to having stories that are, are divorced from different voices and different perspectives. Um, so when I go back and I look at history, I like to, to say, like, we were so close to being a nation without slavery. It was in the constitution, but that phrase was taken out in order to get the Southern states to align and um, overthrow, you know, and get rid of, the, you know, the British, right? So, I mean, we were so close. Um, and another thing I, I hear from people is like, well, you know, Africans were rounding up their own people and selling them too. That's part of the history too. And I always like to say, do you buy everything that's being sold? What kind of nation would we, could we have said or been if we had never bought them? Even if they're on sale, did we have to buy them? I was like, no, let's, why don't we do something different? You know, um, but that's not the case, right? So going back in history, I think what we need to do is acknowledge the fullness of history, good, bad, and indifferent. So we can say, hey, you know, this person did amazing stuff. You know, Thomas Jefferson didn't want slaves, but he owned slaves and had kids with them and, and you know, and raped black women. So what does that do? You have to, you need to look at it full in the face and say, okay, what can we learn from it? And what do we not want to pass down? So I, I know people whose, um, relative ancestors fought in the Civil War as a Confederate. So what do you do with that history? So you need to look at it fully and say, okay, he was fighting for an ideal that was wrong. What can I take from that? You know, whether that be fighting for something that you believe that let's make it on the right side of history this time, but you can't deny that you had a grandfather, a great grandfather that fought in the Civil War and wanted to own people. Does that mean, okay, I need to take everything he believed in and then instill and be like, yo, great grandfather, you know, he prayed before going to battle, you know? And I was like, okay, but um, what was he praying about? States rights. Well, what were one of the states rights? <laughs> he said, well, they wanted to own a people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they want their own people. Like, um, but I think for me, when I look at history, I always call it our history. Like black history is our history. Just founding fathers are my founding fathers too. Even though, you know, some, you know, were racist, some were believers, some were agnostic, but that's part of history. You cannot just pull a strand out and say, okay, that's, we're not going to deal with that or look at it. Um, because it distorts the whole image. It just, just distorts everything. So I think it's important to keep those things, you know, and people talk about, you know, the stat erasing statues is erasing history. And I'm like, well, how many times did you actually read the plaque? Did you actually read it? I don't think it's because you have nothing, no, no idea about it. Just like um, one of the things, uh, it's, it's, it's really disheartening. So for a long time in New York, there was a statue of a man, and I forget his name, it's gonna bother me, but he's considered the father of gynecology, figured out some medical issue. But he was in the rural South operating on black and enslaved women without anesthesia because they were quote, not worth it. 
you know, and one woman went under the knife, I think, 13 times, no anesthesia, you know, operating a, a system, uh, you know, it was, um, I can't remember what the, what the disease or the cause was, but it had to do with, you know, the private parts, you know, I'm just trying to be discreet, but imagine getting operated with no anesthesia. And then once he figured it out, he moved his practice up New York, opened it up and offered anesthesia to his white client, father of gynecology. Now, does gynecology help us? Is it good? Yes. And we also, like, we honor this man. Like, oh, either, but the history we lost. Look at history full on and grapple with it. That's what we need to do is grapple with it because we're in danger of doing the exact same thing that was perpetrated in the past, but just in a different way. You know, just like saying, you know, black people are more violent or savage or um, more sexual deviants and things of that nature. Um, we'll just do it more subtly, but we're still doing the same thing of operating on enslaved people without anesthesia. Yeah. Uh, um, there was, I know there's other parts of your question. Remind me if I have not answered them. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, when you said savage, have you seen the movie Zootopia? I have, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that mm -hmm. I, that was such a good, like, our kids like it, but then as you're watching mm -hmm. it, you're like, oh, that is so good. Yes, that it's is a so metaphor. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really um, good. Yeah. So I, I think uh, you said a really good word there in that uh, I think you you can tell something's propaganda oftentimes if it's lopsided um, because mm -hmm. uh, heritage and tradition should, in, should be inclusive of the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reminds me of, um, so have you read To Kill a Mockingbird or you, you know about it? I have, yes, okay. yes. So we named our first son Atticus and mm -hmm. we, had, we had chosen that name. And then after we chose the name uh, Harper Lee, I think it is, um, mm -hmm. she came out with her second book or announced mm -hmm. that her second book was coming out. Um, and then everybody started naming their kids Atticus. But um, mm -hmm. my wife read the second book and everybody hated that book. Um, mm -hmm. except for her, she liked it because, um, in the book, you know, Atticus Finch, who is this, uh, this guy, this man of integrity in the first book. Mm -hmm. Um, and he is, he's just this, this staunch protagonist in the second mm -hmm. book. You're like, oh, he, you know, some of his motives weren't good. He has some racist beliefs, even though mm -hmm. he, he helped his, his black client. He's mm -hmm. just, he's he becomes very complex and he's not like a, right. You're like, he's not really bad, but he's not mm -hmm. really all good. So, uh, you know, we're used to these Marvel superhero movies yeah. where all good mm -hmm. or all bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, That's propaganda. Yeah. That's propaganda. It hates complexity. I mean, you said that yourself. It hates complexity and loves simplicity because you can wrap it up in a neat little bow. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. A, spot on. So um, I, I think what you said there about, um, you know, you know, heritage and tradition versus propaganda is, you know, a accepting all of our history. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's that's good. And I have to remind myself of the opposite a lot of times that mm -hmm. it, as I look through American history, I'm like, man, there's no good, nothing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. right. And so right. I have to remind myself that there there is good and uh, to be able to to kind of balance that out and recognize truth mm -hmm. the good truth and the mm -hmm. bad truth mm -hmm. yeah correct correct um all right so next question uh wh when i think about um our history and mm -hmm. when i think about racism and and the bad things that have happened to black people um as i as i reflect on on how i used to think i used to think Oh yeah, that was you know slavery up to civil rights, um, mm -hmm. and basically once you get civil rights, um, I mean you're you're good to go. Like now you're you're right. one, you're one of us, and mm -hmm. th there are a lot of things that kind of shattered that realization for me. A, a number of of different events, um, mm -hmm. but one of the ones that was the most profound was when I was at um, a, a a rally or whatever it was um, for. I think it was the the one race movement. Um, one of the mm -hmm. speakers um, said that uh, you know he was he was talking to his 
his mom and he's like, mom, why didn't you like, or his grandma, why didn't you keep fighting for rights? And she was just like, mm-hmm. we were just so tired. And I was like, mm-hmm. what? Did, oh, he, so, so they didn't really accomplish everything mm-hmm. then. Right. Like they mm-hmm. just kind of, um, it, it, it was a realization for me where mm-hmm. I thought that rights were obtained mm-hmm. and everything was good to go, but the black community mm-hmm. recognized mm-hmm. that that's not the truth. So maybe you could talk about maybe some of the propaganda surrounding um, what actually happened with the civil rights movement, why Mm -hmm. the black community by and large doesn't think that that that, um, Mm -hmm. was maybe as good as as a lot of white people think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, you know, speaking of the civil rights, um, one thing, you know, you say, you know, at your sign off, you know, because I'm a pacifist. When I say it, I mean it, you know, when you tell people peace. Um, I recently, well, I've been having an internal struggle with pacifism um, because you have two people, you have, you have MLK and you have Mac, Malcolm X and are often pitted against each other. And to me, I hold this idea that I honestly think for change to happen, you need both. I think, you know, I think, you know, the peace led movement, it does show the monster because when you're not violent, it shows them as a monster, right? Just like when Emmett Till's casket was open, it shows like, wow, or the images you see of uh, a black man being attacked by dogs, you know, and they're doing a peaceful protest, right? It shows that. But if there's no, there's no underlying course of like, if you, if you push me too far, like, we're going to have to do something, you know? So I think we, I do think we need both. But so, so civil rights just on paper legally said, oh, you know, it, you are now a citizen. That, you know, that's all it did. Um, which it said it took so long to be recognized as a citizen of this nation, even though every major US conflict in our history, black people have fought in, every major conflict, Every single one, even when we were slaves, fought in uh, for this country, for its ideals. And you're like, why? Because they believed something that this nation could be, even though they didn't experience it. You know, how would it, how would, you know, feel like you fought for this country and then you come home and you don't get the same rights that you're fighting for? There's a, a battle in World War II where black and white soldiers fought against each other. In, in, um, England because they're allowed in the pubs and their white soldiers was like you can't allow them here and they're like this is not your country you know they they can enter in here and a battle was actually fought against white soldiers and black soldiers because they weren't in their place so um fast forward a little bit civil rights happens and you know you know right to vote yes you know all this stuff is good and it's just like it was just on paper. So this legislation doesn't change the hearts of men. So even though you, you you gain these inalienable rights that should have been granted from the beginning, doesn't necessarily mean circumstances on the ground have changed. So, you know, all the time, then what happened? Jim Crow happened. So every, if you look at every step that has been advanced or gained by the black community, I'm speaking about the black community, there's always a reaction to it to push it back. So you have, you know, the freedom you have. Okay, so let's say you had slavery and then slaves started escaping. And then what did they, they, they passed the Fugitive Slave Act to get them back. Slavery ends and then you have um, indentured servitude, sharecropping. Um, you get civil rights back and then what do you have? You have Jim Crow. Um, you say three words, black lives matter, and then you have blue lives matter. So everything that's, there's always gonna be a reaction to push push it back. Um, And so we have Jim Crow, which is a little bit more subtle than the um, sharecropping, which is a little bit more subtle than the Fugitive Slave Act, which is a little bit more subtle than outright slavery. And then even with the passage of these laws, you have subtlety. You know, I hate the most is reading 
that slavery is abolished except in the payment of crime or except in, you know, for crime that you are duly convicted. And then we can talk about incarceration rates, right? Hmm. Yeah, you had you had convict it, leasing and uh, war on drugs, all kinds of things. Right. Yes. All all that, ha- and it's like all of it plays in, into that role. And then you know, I tie it back to you know the fall of man, where we're each clamoring for dignity, so we subjugate others to get that value. Um, and so. With that, all, with that being said about, you know, that phrase, and so you have in car- mass incarceration rates, um, and largely, you know, and all that, that is due to poverty, you know, like you said, like poverty plays a large role. And why do we have poverty? Uh, because of injustices, you know, and propaganda, you know, it likes nice little neat packages, right? And no outside voices. So for me, there is, I think, in my opinion, there is a nice little neat little time in history where you can almost pinpoint generational property, ghettos and hoods, and why it's still perpetuated today. It is after World War II, the GI Bill was largely refused to Black veterans. And after that time, we see wealth being accumulated generational wealth where you know a veteran can come home get a mortgage and pay out their house they have a they have an asset now right that can be handed down to their kids who can build upon that right and you keep building and building and building but let's say you come home as a black veteran you don't get that gi bill you can't buy a house you get redlined so where do you buy the cheapest cheapest house that you find or you rent and what do you not get to do? You do not get to build generational wealth, asset, something that you can hand down. And you can see almost from that point how things just continue to get worse and worse and why ghettos and hoods and, you know, and gangs and violence and all that stuff that is propagated that that's all we do came to be. And there's an element of truth to that. Um, so it's interesting. If you ever have time, go back and look at the GI Bill and what happened after that. And even like the color of law talks about, do they talk about talk about redlining in there and how recent that happens? Personal anecdote, personal story. When my wife went to look at houses, I always had her go in first to ask about the house, to get the pamphlet. She asked me why, and I told her, I don't want them to to say they have a buyer when they see me. And it's just that's just how I walk, you know, because largely I walk in, in white circles and I tend to be in, in white spaces and things like that. So I am considered more of like, well, I term myself like the safe black person. People can ask me any question, right? And I don't shy away from just, you know, it's just ask. If it's on your mind, ask. Even if you say, well, it's going to sound racist, just ask the question, you know, and I'll tell you. Um, but so that to me, you know, that's a personal, personal story. Um, and I think I kind of, kind of forgot, the, forgot the question here. Um, but I, you know, I hope that, you know, I'm not just going on too many tangents or rabbit holes. No, it's good. Yeah. I, so, um, even though I definitely identify as a, a pacifist and think that that is the, mm-hmm. the best way to convey sure. the, the, the kingdom of god at the same time mm-hmm. i do i do have a lot of respect for people like malcolm x and um mm-hmm. i don't know if you're familiar with robert f williams but mm-hmm. he is not as much yeah he is like my favorite um at the moment okay. even though he was he was pro violence he didn't he didn't ever really use violence but mm-hmm. he he definitely used the the threat of it like hey this is what i'm capable of mm-hmm. um but you should you should read up on on him. Okay, uh, he, he's got a book called Negroes with Guns, which is is good. Mm-hmm. But um, there's there's actually another book which is a lot more detailed because he doesn't mm-hmm. he's a really humble guy. He doesn't toot his own horn at all. Um, but mm-hmm. the, his the biography of him like really goes into his exploits a whole lot more and mm-hmm. and uh, and plays him up. Uh, but it's called Radio Free Dixie, 
And he actually okay. uh, is, is called that because he, uh, when the FBI chased him for doing nothing, of course, he mm-hmm. uh, he fled to Cuba where, where he was, mm-hmm. you know, he was given free passage and he started mm-hmm. radio station there and, um, and, and started radio free Dixie back into the United mm-hmm. States, to, like uh, trying to teach the black community mm-hmm. about, um, right. N- not rebellion, but you know, Hey, look, we're, we're, we can be free. So he's an mm-hmm. awesome guy. You should check him out. Okay. And I definitely will. Speaking of Cuba, here's another side, just like the history of baseball has a lot of Negro leagues that stayed in Cuba and would play ball down there and be like, this is great. Like I'm not going back. And we're actually like Americans, white Americans were angry that they would stay over there. It's like, you need to come back to America. It's like, well, why? Like the history of, look at the history of ba- baseball in regards to, uh, you know, South America and Cuba where they experienced a lot more freedom. They're like, yeah. I think I'll stay here. I think I'm good. I'll check out. I'll check out. What is it? it's uh? You said Robert Fellows. Uh, Robert F. Williams. I'll I'll send yeah, you. Yeah, okay. for the, yeah, for the, definitely do that. Yeah. yeah, I think you mentioned him a couple times in uh, previous podcasts. Yeah, episodes. he's he's pretty amazing. Um, but it it also part of why I read that was because, um, you know he was he was involved in depropagandizing, um, mm-hmm. because when you hear like wait a second cuba is communist um what do you mm-hmm. mean what do you mean people are going to cuba to be free mm-hmm. and that just mm-hmm. that that messes with the american right. mindset that right. uh, we're free here right going back to um propaganda one thing i wanted to bring up too was the other side of propaganda so let's say you have images you know that are overtly racist right and and they they show like minstrel C and they show you know blackface and the you know the big lips and the you know um, the big nose and being a savage and you know like all that stuff when we think of racist imagery, right? To the people that it's not directed toward, that's the enemy. Yeah, they're like that. But the people that it's representing, after a while, if you see this year after year, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, you know, 120 years, you begin to believe it, that this is who you are, right? You start ingesting those ideas that you perhaps, maybe you are inferior. Maybe this is true about me. Yeah, there is a, is a lot of crime. So the, the opposite side, the converse side of propaganda is those are insulated from it. They have their own breeding ground, their own echo chambers, and they're safe. The ones who are on the outside are not safe for two reasons. One, propaganda created an enemy. Two, that enemy begins to ingest that propaganda themselves and begins to believe it. And they start to, you know, self-fulfill prophecy. That is very true. I was talking to um, a man you know, I, I work in a logistic field, so we have a lot of truck drivers. Um, a man, he's in his um, mid-70s. Alive, alert, looks great, you know. Um, funny, you know, black don't crack. Like, you would never know he was set, he was in his 70s. And he's telling me he remembers the signs that say colored only. As a kid, he remembers sitting in the back of the bus. He remember like, he, he says, I can viscerally feel feel what it's like even as a young kid that you're inferior that your water fountain looks a hell of a lot different than the white water fountain and you do not drink from there he remembers being the first class to desegregate a school in texas you know and he said i just remember being in high school and they're saying, oh, they're going to rape, rape our women. And then we desegregate that school and the white girls can't keep their hands off of, you know, and he, you know, and I'm not saying it's like, I'm just using the term, you know, the terms. And he's just like, and then we get accused of rape. And he's like, you, and we we're trying to bat these women, like girls off us because like, we knew what it meant if we were caught, you know? And he's like, and then, you know, lies are spread. If you reject her, you raped me. If you go with her, you can be killed. And he says, I remember in Texas, they called it a hanging tree. 
And he said, one of my friends met one week, he did something with a girl and he was on that tree. This is a person who's alive, you know? And I'm just like, so this is what propaganda does. It can be subtle, but the, the other side of it is not so subtle, it's dangerous. Um, and my own grandparents, I think I shared their story in the Black History Month. My grandfather and the, the famous Woolsworth sit-ins happened all across, there was more than one Woolsworth. The famous one I think is in Chicago, but there's one in Norfolk, Virginia. My grandfather was the first one to go behind the counter and sit down in a, in, at a stool that said whites only. My grand, so that's a history that I have, you know? And I'm just like, that's history you can touch. It's not so long ago. And it's just like the mindset when you begin to inject it. Ibrahim um, X. Kendi talks a lot about this in his book about anyone can ingest and begin to believe racist material, even the one that it's perpetrated against because of how long it's been ingested that maybe you are inferior. Um, I just want to kind of highlight that as well. No, I, I think that's important. There's um, there's the famous study. Um, I, I don't know if it was from the 60s or 50s or whenever, but, um, you know, where, where they had children that uh, were, were taught that they were inferior you know primed right to think that way mm -hmm. uh, you know kids with blue eyes whatever or yeah i remember um, that study yeah but there's a i just finished a book uh called chokehold which okay. uh is written by a black man who is or at least was a prosecutor and it mm -hmm. was really fascinating because you know he he wasn't just talking about theory he's saying hey look i was a prosecutor I dressed this way. Here's what I thought. Like, I mm. wanted to nail those, those punks. I laughed when they mm. came into the courtroom dressed a particular way. Cause I knew I could, mm. I could nail them and get them the maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he talks about how he internalized propaganda mm -hmm. to, uh, and then how that impacted the way that he treated, um, you know, he treated black people or he looked at them mm -hmm. as inferior. And uh, he mm -hmm. also gave some interesting statistics that um, he talked about how, Black police officers um, mm -hmm. have a higher rate of of violence towards Black people. Mm -hmm. um, he so he part of what he he talks about is just the internalization, um, right? Of right. That. Yeah. And, uh, so exactly what you were saying. It was, mm -hmm. it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I think last question here. Um, mm -hmm. So, in regard to Black history. You know, there are a lot of people who are are familiar with things like the Tuskegee experiments. You know, mm -hmm. mo most people know about that uh, as mm -hmm. as okay. That's a, a conspiracy that that really was true. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, of course, that that has come to light. But mm -hmm. when I read through your Black History Month stories, I'm like, man, there's that's that's a scratch on the surface. There's so much mm -hmm. that that people don't know about. Um, mm -hmm. so the, uh, a couple months ago when you did your black history month, you had a story on, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is it? Virtus Hardiman. Yeah. Uh, and where he and his, his siblings were experimented on mm -hmm. similar to the Tuskegee experiment. Mm -hmm. So I would say that most of my friends probably view racist examples in history as kind of mm -hmm. like exceptions. Oh, uh, well that happened, mm -hmm. you know, way back then, or that happened, sporadically at this place or that place mm -hmm. it's not it's not really a rule it's the exception mm -hmm. right at the, at the same time so that they, they they view uh, offenses against black people as the exception but mm -hmm. they simultaneously view black crime as the rule mm -hmm. and not the exception mm -hmm. you know black people are violent mm -hmm. and they probably wouldn't say that but right they, they mm -hmm. think it. so maybe you can kind of unpack um how the a history of violence against black mm -hmm. people isn't an exception and this double mm -hmm. standard that that my community has where we we individualize our flaws while generalizing the flaws of the other group mm -hmm. right yeah oh great question so um so the first one um there's a book i read and it talked all about like medical atrocities within the black community that happened um uh, medical Holocaust. Um, I'll find it and I'll and I'll 
let you know later what that what that book was. But it talks a lot about um, in the medical field what that happens and how it's still kind of pervasive. I mentioned it before about the opioid crisis, about you know medical field is still treating black people as you know inferior or not preferring, not listening to their pain meds. Um, and just the statistics about how many black women actually die in pregnancy in a first world country than their white counterpart is astounding. Um, I'm not gonna give it because I don't know what that stat statistic is, but when you look it up, it is pretty astounding. Um, and so I would, so the big ones that we know of would be the exceptions, right? The ones that kind of happen pervasively um, throughout like, you know, hearing stories here and there about a woman not getting COVID-19 treatment, finding out she's black. And a lot of times when we see and we realize these things, it's kind of like, yeah, that happens to us. We know there is a strong distrust of the medical field in the black community um, due to atrocities that happen to us, strong distrust. Um, I even re I did before this happened, I even recognized propaganda that was happening in the black community about for the COVID-19 vaccine. Even though um, regardless of what your stance is on the vaccine, but commercial after commercial would talk about this vaccine, I, you know, I'm going to take it because I know it was worked on by black doctors. And black the black community, we have a higher rate of, you know, diabetes, which will actually make COVID-19 even worse. Right? Those things are true, but the idea with that propaganda was to subvert the propaganda that was already in place. So, okay, we actually really need you to take this vaccine. Um, even though historically we, we, you know, we did medical scientific stuff or, you know, experiments on you, but it's been, it was done by black doctors. They helped work on the vaccine. So y'all need to take it, okay? Um, but that propaganda was just to reverse what was done for, for you know, hundreds of years. Um, so generalization versus um, individualizing something. That is something that, you know, I've looked into or I've thought about and pondered, why is this the case? And I think it, it's a myriad of, of, of different things, but I think one of the biggest things is the black community is often seen as a monolith, right? I mean, we even had someone saying, you know, our current president saying, oh, the, you know, the Latin community is more diverse than the black community, right? We're often seen as a monolith. And that is not without its truth. There's always a little bit of truth. Why are we seen as monolithic? So therefore we can, you know, we can generalize everything to a whole people group. It's because the black, uh, you know, experience black people had to become more cohesive in order to survive, you know? So a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that after the, the right to vote passed, there was classes on how to answer questions so you can actually vote, you know what I mean? So there's cohesion in there. How to, you know, stand together, the bus boycott, there's cohesion in there. So being a monolithic culture we tend to be that way because we know that that's what we did to survive. Even phrasing within the black community is monolithic, meaning if a national tragedy ha happens, an atrocity happens, a lot of us say, oh, I hope he's not black. Why? Because we know, and we'll even say, because it'll set us 10 years back. Why is that the case? Because there is that monolithic idea, that, that culture that is pervasive, both by our doing to survive, right? Um, but also propaganda likes to put things in boxes. So they, them, they always do this or other, it, others people, right? So twofold is why individual happens. And then largely within white America, the rugged individual as, individual as the American, right? We are individual, you know, freedom and this, that, and the other. You can't tell us what to do. That ideology plays a role in why when you fail or you do something wrong, it's individual. Like, oh, they did that. That's not all of us. We're not all rapists, you know. Um, but if it happens to someone that's Black, 
they're all like this. They're rapists because of those two factors at play, right? Rugged individualism, monolithic culture, one to survive, one, the burgeoning you know, of a nation, right? And that whole ideology and that mindset of what America is, right? Um, so to me, I think that's why this happens. That's why it's generalized. And I don't, it should not be that way. Um, but sadly it, it is. And I don't really know how to, um, to do, to counteract that. For instance, like also when you have success stories, like largely, you know, when a black person is successful, you're like, see, look, he's successful. And it's like the exception, not the rule. You know, we had a, a black president. Oh, that's awesome. Or we can still name first blacks. Some, you know, Simone Manuel became the first black woman to receive a swimming medal in the Olympics. You know, and that happened what four years ago in the Summer Olympics. Like we're still naming firsts, <laughs> and um, that should be that should be the success should be not the exception. That should be the rule. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of swimming medals, it's one of those things that. You know, um, black people are are known to not be great swimmers, um, mm -hmm. or, or or to to like the pool and um, right. I mean, the people say because they have denser bones. You know, like no, no. Well, I so I reading that that book mm -hmm. on Robert Williams, it mm -hmm. clicked for me. I was like, I'm an idiot. But so mm -hmm. uh, one of the the big confrontations that he had was he he went out and he protested that um, blacks weren't allowed to use the pool. Uh, the mm -hmm. the community pool, and so he, part one of the stories, one of the things that kind of got them fired up was that um, they there were some black kids who went to the local quarry because that's where mm -hmm. they would swim, and they ended up drowning, and um, mm -hmm. so I was like, oh my goodness, like so it's it's probably it, it's not this like well they have an aversion to water or they have mm -hmm. denser bones or whatever else it's mm -hmm. no they were excluded from the place where people go to learn to swim safely and parents mm -hmm. were like, no, you're not going to go to the quarry. Right. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're insulated from being able to learn how mm -hmm. to swim. And that was, Correct. that was yeah. just a, a revelation for me mm -hmm. of like this, this, um, this racism, how it's impacted mm -hmm. people um, to develop a, a particular action mm -hmm. stereotypically. And uh, right. Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. so tragic that that you know black people were swimming in quarries and dying, mm -hmm. and so they were prevented from from swimming right. at all. Yeah, when you put them to get put start putting pieces together, you're just like, wow, I never saw it this way. And still to this day, because the confluence of cities, you know, they don't have access to the pools in the gated community. So still, there's a lot of black people who cannot swim. Um, and then you have, you know, it is easier and cheaper. Let's say you have a, a school that's struggling. It's cheaper to put a track or basketball and offer that a sport than a swimming pool because of the money. So then you'll have natural excelling at track sports, you know? And I, I mean, I love the Olympics. I love watching track. I'm just like, yeah, look at that. Look at all that black, black girl magic, black boy magic. You know what I mean? I just love seeing it. And it's just like, um, why is it? Now you can do some scientific stuff and, and look at slow twitch and fast twitch fibers and, and muscles and things like that. Uh, but it is largely based on access and injustice and poverty. Uh, I, th I think that's all I have for you that I could I could think mm -hmm. of. Um, is, is there anything that you'd like to to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, two things. One, I would encourage um, any of the listeners who have not seen the documentary Thirteenth, watch it. Um, and there's other things that you can watch too, but that watch that one. Secondly. If you love podcasts, listen to Wrongful Conviction. Have you heard of that one? Um, it's with um, uh, Jason Flom, and they are part of exonerating, you know, death row um, innocent people. It's an innocent project, right? So he heads up the innocent project, and it will open your eyes to there is a different legal system for poor people 
there's a different legal standard for poor black people and poor white people, right? And you even mentioned in the in your racism segment about you would think the people that had the most in common, poor white people and poor black people, you know, they could like work together, but oftentimes they did not, right? Um, you know, they would say I'd rather be poor and white, you know, than you know to be a black person, right? So it's called wrongful conviction, and it's just story after story after story, and you're just like of people when they were teenagers getting locked up for decades, you know? And beside that, the last thing on it, there was just a Supreme Court case that got passed that if you are, no other evidence can be, for a death row inmate, no other external evidence can be admitted in your case. Yes, yes. Um, in your in your in your case that wasn't presented before, because usually it'd be like, well, new evidence has come to light. Um, I think it's a, a segment of of cases. I think it's whether if you were on death row or if you had a certain amount of appeal, but still, they have made that uncom. You cannot do that anymore, and who that is going to affect a large amount of minorities. Who are innocent in yeah i'll have to uh i'll have to research that and look look yeah. that up and see what the the rationale is because I, I know that mm-hmm. i know that the justice system likes to look right and so you know is this is this mm-hmm. a response to um right we, we don't want to plug up our system anymore with appeals because mm-hmm. we've already got you know too many too many things going on mm-hmm. or is it because we want to look like we got it right the first time and we don't want to keep right. turning these mm-hmm. yeah. right yeah yeah, but wrongful commission. You'll learn a lot in, in that podcast. Okay. So yeah, that's that's all I had. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, for giving me uh, an hour and a half of your time. Oh uh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks for staying up this late too. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Mm-hmm.